Bless the Lord Jesus, I greet you in the most exalted name of Jesus. I'm glad that we are able to be a part of another Bible study. Amen. And I pray God that as we go through the study tonight and we continue along the theme, earnestly contending, amen, that we will learn something from the Word of God tonight. Let's bow our heads as we approach God in prayer. Amen. Great God, we come before you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your love, your mercy, your grace. God, I pray that you'll open our understanding tonight that we might understand the scriptures. I pray, God, that whatever word that comes from my mouth tonight will come from heaven's throne and that somebody will leave edified, somebody will, will leave this Bible study session blessed and that at the end of the session, God, that we will be able to say, God, that you have spoken and the church say, Amen. I pray, now, God, that you'll touch the minds, the hearts, the soul of every person who would watch this Bible study, those who are watching it right now and those who will be watching it later on. I pray God you'll, be, you'll, you'll bring them to a point where they realize, God, that in this season we need people who are solid, people who are grounded in the Word of God. And we ask you right now, Lord Jesus, that you'll put upon somebody's heart that they too will want to continue in the Word of God. Amen. For it's the Word of God that's going to keep us it is the word of God that's going to judge us in the last day. So we thank you, God, for what you are about to do and for what you have done already. In the most exalted name of Jesus, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So God bless you. God bless you. Welcome, as I said earlier, to another Bible study session. And tonight, we, you know, we're going to look at another aspect of earnestly contending. Tonight, we'll be looking at the importance of sound doctrine. You know, um, you know, a lot of people have come up with a lot of different uh, philosophies and a lot of different ways of looking at doctrine. But what we want to continue in the house of God is sound doctrine. You need people who are sound in the word. And because that's the only way that we'll be able to uh, rightly uh, maneuver ourselves in this season. So we will go to our slides and we will practically move to the scripture in Titus chapter 1. And verse 9 and Titus chapter 2 and verse 1 and 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 3 to 4. It says, Holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught, that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. Amen. So this is Paul writing to Timothy saying that he, that he should hold fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. That he may be able to, that he may be able by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. Then look at Titus chapter two and verse one. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. In this season, as I said before, we need people who would speak sound doctrine. And in First Timothy chapter six and verse three to four it says, if any man teach otherwise, and consent not to do wholesome words even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he said he is proud, knowing nothing, but doubting about questions and stripes of words, whereof commit envy, strive, railing, evil surmising. Praise God. So at the end of the session tonight, our objective is that we want to be able to understand what is sound doctrine. What is sound doctrine? They are going to try to recognize false teaching. Amen. False teaching. And last, we're going to embrace from the Bible sound doctrine. How do I embrace from the Bible sound doctrine? So we want to understand what is sound doctrine. We want to define what it is. Amen. We want to recognize false teaching. Praise God. I want to embrace from the Bible sound doctrine. So, you know, Christianity... Is, 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 a, is a religion that is centered around the love of God and it's a centered around the fact that Jesus came and he died for us. Amen. Before Jesus came on the scene, there was no Christianity. There was no Christian that exists. The church did not exist before Jesus' time. Amen. Jesus had to die, had to be buried, had to be resurrected. And as I taught us last week that he could establish the church. Amen. And therefore, what we believe is centered around the fact that Jesus came and he loves us. Amen. And centered around the fact that he came and he died for us. 
we also realize that the, the church or the belief is really on the fact that Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as I said before, he died, he rose again, and his aim is to redeem mankind from sin. So we believe in the fact that uh, uh, we were created innocent initially, and because of sin, man fell. Amen. And Jesus Christ came on the scene as the Son of God, and he died, he took your place, he rose again. Amen. And the main purpose of that was to redeem mankind from sin. However, we realize over from the, from the church started in the first century, even today, we realize that Christianity, the church has been uh, marred by controversies. You know, there are many people who have come in and they have injected uh, what they think and what they want to believe. Amen. We realize that even as early as the fourth century, amen, where we had people like, or the third century, we had people like uh, Constantine and these men, amen, who came in and they wanted to marry Christianity, amen, with what they knew, paganism. And, and a lot of this has taken place over the years, amen. So the history of Christianity has been marred by controversies and divisions over doctrines, amen. You have, you have cases where, where people were killed, amen, because of what they believed, amen. Um, I, I was watching a, a story, um, I was watching a program, and David K. Bernard was talking about um, a particular young gentleman who, the mere fact that you went contrary to his doctrine, he would have had you killed. I mean, that was how severe and how these men took the whole scriptures strongly, but they wanted to hold on to what they had to do. So the Christianity was marred by controversies and divisions of what doctrine believes and a lot of different practices had emerged in and out of the church. Amen? Now, it is crucial then for every Christian to understand and to abide by sound doctrine. Amen. If you want to be a part of the church of the living God, the church that Jesus established, amen, it's very important that you seek out uh, what exactly is sound doctrine. Amen. And why is it crucial for us to understand and abide by sound doctrines? Because false teachings have led to what is called schism and hearsays and even wars among the believers. Now, schism is a formal division where there's a separation from the church, a uh, religious body over some doctrinal differences. Amen. And hearsay is practically a deviation from accepted Christian doctrine. So, what we want to do is to ensure that as Christians, we abide by sound doctrine so that we can avoid false teachings. Amen. Secondly, we have realized that false prophets, teachers, and doctrines have arisen to deceive um, the people who are faithful in the house of God and to lead them astray from truth. And therefore, as Christians, it's very important that we understand sound doctrine. It's very important that we understand the importance of sound doctrine because we must realize that in this season there are a lot of false prophets, there are a lot of false teachers, and there are a lot of false doctrine. And the aim of this is simply to lead you away from truth uh, and, to, and, and to lead the faithful away from truth. Amen. Lead them astray from the truth of God's word. And therefore, it's important then that we keep sound doctrine because sound doctrine is what safeguards us against false teachings and fosters spiritual growth and maturity. So there are two aspects to sound doctrine. It, it, it safeguards you against the whole concept of false teachings that exist. And secondly, it fosters spiritual growth and maturity as a child of God. Now, understanding of sound doctrine. Now, it's very important that we realize that sound doctrine, and what, we, what we're trying to do is to define what exactly sound doctrine is. Sound doctrine refers to the teaching of the Bible that is, well, better, teachings that are consistent with the Bible. Secondly, the teachings that are consistent with the apostles of the first century. And secondly, it's a guideline 
uh, or teaching that goes along with the guidelining of the Holy Spirit. So sound doctrine refers to the teachings of our doctrines that are consistent with Scripture. Amen. In other words, whatever you're teaching has to be consistent with what the Word of God says. Secondly, and when we talk about the Word of God, I'm talking about the Word of God in, 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 in general, from Genesis to Revelation. It must be consistent in Scripture. Now, you might say, okay, there seem to be contradictions in Scripture. And can I tell you this? As you study more, you'll realize that if you find a contradiction, it means that you fully have not understood the passage. Um, because in truth, there is no contradiction in scriptures. And I, and, and, I, and I can prove that to you with any verse that you bring to me. But apart from the fact that it must be consistent with what the Bible has to say, it must be consistent with what the apostles thought. If anybody's going to come to you and they go contrary to what the apostles usually teach, we know that that is not sound doctrine. And thirdly, it must be consistent with the guidelines of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Amen. And bring all things to your remembrance. So, sound doctrine is practically reliable. And it's trustworthy. It's a trustworthy guide for faith and for life. And it provides a clear and a coherent understanding of God's nature, will, and purpose. What do I mean by that? What am I saying is that when we get into sound doctrine, amen, what is going to happen is that at the end of the day, it lines up with not just the things that I just spoke about, but it lines up with the very nature of God. It lines up with the will of God and it lines up with the purpose of God. If you realize that your, your doctrine is leading you contrary to where God would have you to be, then something is wrong with it. If you realize that your doctrine is not in line with the will of God, then something is wrong with it. And if it's not in line with the purpose of God for your life, then something is wrong with it. Because sound doctrine is supposed to be reliable and a trustworthy guide uh, for faith and life and provides a clear understanding of God's nature, God's will, and God's purpose. Now, why then is sound doctrine important? And I, and I think that I've highlighted some things already. But we can move a little further as to even deeper as to define why sound doctrine is very important. Now, sound doctrine is important because it's very crucial for your salvation. What I, I have a friend and he always shows me clearly that notice whenever false teaching comes in, it has a way of not just, a, it, it, it might seem small initially, but it has a way that over time, it leads people away from God. I have seen where one introduction of a teaching that was different than what uh, that we have known over the years have changed the minds and the hearts of a lot of believers. I've seen in one particular place, everybody has shifted from the foundation of the apostolic teaching, amen, and they have gone contrary to a total different set. And we see where it keeps on building up and building up. So it erodes here and then slowly it removes there. So first it attacks. Uh, the deity of God, then probably attacks the baptism, then it start, attacks your lifestyle, but it keeps on eroding and eroding. And that's why it's very important that we adhere to sound doctrine because it is crucial for your salvation for you to be saved. It is crucial for your sanctification and it is crucial for your service. And we're going to talk about this later on, all of these three points in terms of your salvation, your sanctification and your service. Now, sound doctrine also serves as the foundation of faith. Uh, it's, 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 as I said last week, one of the foundations of faith is the gospel. But sound doctrine is also the foundation of faith. Amen. What you believe determines what you do. Amen. And therefore, it's very important when you hold on to the word of God that you hold on to the foundation of what the truth of God's word. Amen. It's the basis of your worship. Amen. When you start believing God, and I'm going to show you some, some stories where when people start drifting and shifting, amen, how it affects even their very view of God. And it affects your standard of conduct, amen, how you carry yourself, how you think, amen, how you walk, how you talk. All of these things are grounded in your doctrine. And therefore, if your doctrine is not sown, you're going to realize that you're going to be shifting to the left. And shifting to the right. Amen. So therefore it's very important that we have sound doctrine. 
It shapes what you believe. It shapes your attitude. It shapes your values. Amen. It provides a true representation of God and his plan of redemption. That's what sound doctrine does. Amen. So therefore, um, if sound doctrine does this, it means that, that false teaching will do the opposite of this. Amen. False teaching is also going to shape your belief. But shape your belief where? False teaching is also going to affect your attitude. But affect your attitude how? It's going to change your values. Amen. When, when you have sound doctrine, amen, it, it allows us to realize that the very way we dress, amen, and, 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 and these things are affected because we, we have accepted some things that are contrary to sound doctrine, amen. It affects your values, how you look at things, how you look at, how you deal with business, how you deal with your co-worker, how you deal with your brother, sound doctrine. And as I said before, what makes it even the more important is that it provides sound doctrine, provides a true representation of God and his plan of redemption. When you have sound doctrine, then you start to see truly it mirrors back with the almighty God and what he truly stands for. So because of this now, amen, we realize that it's very important that we adhere to, um, to sound doctrine. And the Bible at multiple times would warn us about uh, uh, false prophets and teachers. And it's crucial for every Christian to understand and abide by sound doctrine, which is not only safeguards against false teaching, but also fosters, as I said before, spiritual growth and maturity. Now, look at what the Bible has to say in relation to the importance of sound doctrine. As I said before, sound doctrine protects us from error. It protects us from false teaching and spiritual deception. So Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus. And he said, look here. For we thenceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro with every, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slay of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up in him in all things which is the head even christ but notice what paul was saying that when you have sound doctrine you're practically not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine it means that there are a lot of teachings out there there are a lot of the philosophies that will come but when you have sound doctrine you're not tossed to and fro like today you accept this and tomorrow you're on the other side of the fence we don't know amen but when you are grounded in sound doctrine amen you will not be cared about with every wind of doctrine no more like children tossed to and fro and cared about with every wind of doctrine praise god so sound doctrine encourages us to anchor ourselves in truth. I know that that word truth is a powerful word. Because when you look at that, you know, you know, the world today has a different concept and a different philosophy when it comes down to truth. But we're going to talk about that. But what sound doctrine does, it encourages us to be anchored in truth. Capital truth. Absolute truth. Amen. And the discerning in our judgments. In other words, when we have sound doctrine, we're able to decipher between what is of God and what is not of God. Our judgment becomes sharper because of what we believe. And if you don't believe it, the Bible itself is biased towards sound doctrine. The Bible is telling us that we need to do or to keep sound doctrine in our lives. Amen. So there are numerous scriptures that actually tell us that uh, street of God that we have to deal with sound doctrine it, because this is what God wants of us hear what Paul said to Timothy he said for the time will come amen when they will not endure sound doctrine my God but after their own loss shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. If you look at that particular verse in the NIV, it reads like this. It says, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Amen. Instead, to, their, to suit their own desires, praise God, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. 
Praise God. They will turn their ears, their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. If you look at that particular verse, amen, you realize that Paul was writing to his protege, he was writing to his fellow young Christian leader in the church. And he was telling him about the state of the church that is going to happen in the future. I strongly believe that this was a prophetic word. Because notice how he started. He said, for the time will come. Which means that he was saying, Timothy, look out for this. But I strongly believe that even more now, we need to look out for this. He said, for the time will come. So Paul warns that a time will come when people will reject sound doctrine. And can I tell you, brethren, no, in this season, I have never seen it more than I've seen it today. People are rejecting sound doctrine. They are rejecting sound teaching based on the truth and the accuracy of God's word. And guess what? They do this in favor of teachings that satisfy their own desires and their own preferences. My God. So Paul was saying there's going to come a time where people are going to seek out teachers who will tell them what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. So we are living in a season where people gravitate towards the, 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 the motivational speakers. They gravitate towards people who will tell them what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. In essence, what Paul was saying is that uh, the passage is calling us to remain faithful to the truth of the gospel and to be discerning in the teaching that we listen to and accept amen in other words not every teaching that comes on the tv is something that we should accept it's not every teaching that sounds sweet and nice is what we should accept we should be discerning of the teachings that we listen to and the teachings that we accept and paul is warning us against the temptation to prioritize our personal desires over the pursuit of truth. Amen. And the dangers of being swayed by false teaching that distort the truth. Amen. And, and therefore, you, you accept the truth, and then because of that distort, of the truth you start to shift you start to go and you realize that your whole life is being affected in other words you 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 do things that please your flesh you do things that please what you want amen and no longer what jesus want and, and if you look at how the many scriptures operated for example john when john saw jesus he said i must decrease and he must increase. He put himself in a position where he was lower. Paul said, oh, that I may know him, not in the power of his resurrection, but also in the fellowship of his suffering. Amen. But we are living in a season, amen, where people don't want to hear the, the word of God from a perspective of living right. Amen. And once you preach a message like that, once you teach a topic like that, amen, they don't want to hear that. So they seek out teachers. They seek out people. They seek out preachers who will tell them what they want to hear. But I'm here to tell you that sometimes it's not what you want to hear. It's what you need to hear. And what you need to hear is that you need to adhere to sound doctrine. And there are many other passages that back up this point. If you look, for example, at Titus chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, But speak now, and I said that earlier, the things will become sound doctrine. Paul was writing to Titus and telling them, this is how you live. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14 says, that, and we just read that, that we should not be tossed to and fro and cared about with every wind of doctrine. Amen. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3 to 7 says, As I beseech you to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. He said, neither give heed to fables or endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. So do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith and faith. From which some have swerved, having turned aside unto vain janglings, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor affirm, or whether they affirm. For war mongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, if there be any other thing that is contrary 
to sound doctrine. In other words, what Paul was saying to Timothy is that when he went to Ephesus, he warns him, praise God, to keep the ensure that he stays in the word. All of these things that are going contrary to what the word of God is saying. That 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 that, that, that thing that, that that and these men who do these things by the Paul said they want to be teachers of the law, but they don't know nothing at all. I'm saying, look, you don't do don't adhere to anything that goes contrary to sound doctrine. I will look at Jude chapter 3. We spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. It said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered. So we, we see where passages are biased towards the fact that sound doctrine is what should hold the church. Sound doctrine is what we need in this season. We need people who will stick to the word, who will stand up for holiness. People who will not waver. People who will not go accord to what they think. And we're going to talk about some of these things, you know. Because what, you're going to what you need to understand is that, uh, that, 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 that these things come in subtly. And I'm going to show you why as we move along. But the next question is, how do I recognize, how do I recognize false teachings? No, false teachings are doctrines or belief that does one of these three things. One, it deviates from the sound doctrine. It deviates from the sound doctrine. And he would pass it to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come, and I said it earlier, when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own loss, Shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears? So false teaching are people, are false teaching, are teachings that go contrary or deviate from what the real word of God says. Now false teaching not only deviate, but it contradicts scripture. So Galatians chapter 1 verse 8 says, But though we... Are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you let him be a curse you see Paul was writing to the church at Galatia and there was an issue what had taken place is that if you can remember there were Jewish Christians who got saved and in theology they are called the Judaizers what they had done they had come into the church and they were teaching another gospel they were teaching something. They were trying to lay another foundation. And can I tell you, in this season, that is what is happen happening. People have been removing the landmark. People have been, been removing the foundation pillars. Stuff that our forefathers have, have, have fought for. Stuff that the apostles died for. Amen. People are removing it. And Paul had to say, look here, who had bewitched you that you had to be doing this? They started to, do, to, to go back to the law. They started to go back to the Old Testament teachings. Amen. Because of these Judaizers. And Paul had to say, look here. If me, we, talking the apostles. If me, the apostle Paul. If Peter, James, John, whoever it is. If an angel from heaven. That was how convinced he was. That the doctrine that he was teaching was from God. If we preach anything else to you, if we start deviating and say we'll get a new revelation, that's what is happening today. Nowadays, everybody has a revelation in terms of what is what and what the word of God says. He said, if I do this, let me be a curse. And for emphasis, he said this twice in Galatians chapter 1. Amen. Because he wanted them to understand the importance of of sound doctrine, but he also wanted to understand the dangers of false teaching. Amen. Secondly, sound doctrine distorts the nature of God and salvation. It distorts the nature of God in the sense that we now see God not as a judge of, of righteousness. We don't see God as a God who wants us to be separated and to be holy. We don't see God now we distort his nature. As a matter of fact, they have this tendency to, to couple it in this thing called love. And they believe that they, they forget that while God is a God of love, 
God is also a God of judgment. Amen. And if you can remember, God does not change anything. Get an example. If God sets a principle, it does not matter who you are. Amen. When you look at the Kohites, these were a set of Israelites, amen, Levites that, 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 that were around the tabernacle. Their main purpose was to ensure that they carry the sacred things, the Ark of the Covenant. They had to carry the, 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 all of these sacred furnitures, the, the brazen altar, the brazen lever. The sacred ones were carried by the, the Kohites. They had the Mirites, they had the Gershonites, but the, the Kohites had a specific purpose. When the tabernacle was taken out of Israel, uh, and, and, and I remember that scripture carefully, and, it was, and, and, and they had it for a time, the Philistines, I thought, took the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, that is. And they had it for a while. And when David became king, so all through the reign of Saul, there was no Ark for a long period of time. When David became king, David wanted the Ark of the Covenant to come back. Amen. And David decided that he was going to go for it. And guess what he did? And, but guess what? God does not deviate from his word. Don't believe because uh, God is a God of love. It means that he will not judge you. Amen. He's a God of love and he loves you so much. Amen. But he's also a God who does not shift from his word. Amen. So he knew who was supposed to carry the Ark of the Covenant. And while they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel on a cart, Uzzah, who was not a cart, decided to touch the Ark because it shifted. And one would have thought that God would have said, boy, all he was doing to try to hold up this thing. All he was trying to do was, you know, it seemed okay. Why would you, you, you don't understand. The man tried to, to, to keep the thing steady, man. There's nothing wrong he did if you look at it. I mean, from our perspective, it looked as if that, that, that Uzzah, Ah, was, was just trying to help God. Was trying to help the situation. But God stands at his word. You see, false teaching, false teaching, distort that. And so look here, you can do this because uh, you have this. Uh, you can do this. Amen. Um, and God won't see because God loves you. No, brethren, God still requires, sound doctrine says that as a child of God, we are, we, as a child of God, as a Christian, we are separated. Sound doctrine says as a child of God, we walk different from the world. Sound doctrine says that God expects this of us. It also distorts our salvation. So we start to realize that the teaching, because there's a little injection of, of, of false teaching, people start saying, no, you're not, you don't need to get baptized to be saved anymore. As a matter of fact, they start attack. I was talking to a goodly brother this morning. He was telling me about the attack on Acts 2.38. You know, Acts 2.38 was not for the Christians. It was for the, was for the Jews only. Amen. And therefore, Peter didn't fully understand the and, it shows you that a little injection of false teaching, praise God, will, will allow these things to happen. So false teaching or doctrine or belief that deviate from sound doctrine, it contradicts the Bible and is a distortion of the nature of God or salvation. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnably here says, even denying the Lord that brought them and bring them upon themselves swift destruction. Peter said, look here, false teachers and false prophets going to come. And guess what? These people are not coming from the outside. These people are among you. And they shall privately bring in damnation and here says into the house of God. My God. How do you know false teaching? I can identify it quickly. False teaching often appeal to human pride. That's the first thing. And can I tell you, the devil knows about pride. He is the author of lies. He is the author of false teaching. It appeals to your pride. It appeals to greed. It appeals to your curiosity. You know, some, I, I had a friend who was a part of church and he was so curious about some things and he just couldn't wait amen he wanted to know this he wanted to know that and today i don't even know where he is because he he, he, he there was spending of time to 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 cement yourself it appealed it's it's what what what, what false teaching does is often an easy or alternative way to spirituality happiness or enlightenment in other words 
it, it, it easy down the thing. You want to do the world, but you want to do church. Amen. And therefore, you, you, you want to marry the two. It's like Pergamos, the church of Pergamos, where, 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 where practically there was a marriage between the world and the church. And God presented himself as the two-edged sword to the church of Pergamos. Because he wants to show that there must be a distinction, a division between the world and the church. But a lot of people, they want an easy alternative spirituality. They want to ensure I'm happy by doing everything that the world does, but I still go to church on a Sunday. Amen. Like it's nominal. Um, most of these nominal assemblies where you, you go to a party last night, you go to a party in the week, amen, you go to Bacchanal, you have got everything, but yet on a Sunday morning you're singing in the choir, amen, and nothing is wrong with that. And these things are slowly infiltrating the apostolic body because people want to do everything that the world does. They want to go everywhere that the world goes, amen. But at the same time, they want to ensure that on a Sunday morning or on a Wednesday or whatever service, they're still okay. Yeah? There's a marriage between what the world does and what the church does. No more a distinction of how they are. Easy to, to identify with all teaching. It appeals to your human pride. It appeals to greed. It appeals to your curiosity. And it offers an uh, a easy alternative. I can do everything what the world do and still be a Christian. I can wear everything what the world wear and still be a Christian. I can dress how the world dress and still, I might say, why you keep on saying how the world dress? Because the world have a way for dress. The world have a way for talk. The world have a way for do business. Now there are some examples of false teaching. And false teaching can take on various forms. And we're going to look at the three different forms that for tonight that we say that false teaching can take on. The first one is hearsays. Now hearsay are false teachings that reject or modify the essential doctrines of the apostles. Doctrines such as the divinity of Christ. Doctrines such as the oneness of God. Doctrines such as the atonement. What hearsay does is that it rejects it. Or in some cases, it just simply modifies the essential doctrines that exist. And we find that this thing don't start today. It started as early as the early of this first century. And then you have modern uh, hearsays that have come around, like the teachings that exist in the Jehovah Witness and the teachings that exist in the Mormons. These are hearsays because they rightly go against what Scripture has to say. Now, I didn't want to use these words unless I define them. Unless I give you an understanding of what they are. So for example, Gnosticism. Gnosticism is a belief that emerged out of the first century. And it became very, very popular. As a matter of fact, during the time of the apostles, amen, it was being developed. And by the second, third century, it was full, full, in full swing. And what Gnosticism says is that the material world is inherently flawed and evil and that salvation can be achieved through secret knowledge or gnosis and through that secret knowledge we get a revelation of the spiritual realm that is beyond the material world and therefore our salvation is based on what we know so gnosticism knowledge so this is where you have teachings like what the Apostle Jude spoke about when he said that men crept in and telling you that you can do some things in your body and therefore it don't affect your spirit because the spirit is good and the material world is flawed. Gnosticism. And these things were happening from as early as the first century. Now, one of the big, biggest problems, as I said earlier, remember I told you that, uh, that um, false teachings affect try to affect every, the very nature of God and these things look at what Gnosticism does it goes as far as to say that the God of the Old Testament was a lesser God and a lesser deity and a higher deity than the God of the Old Testament sent Jesus and Jesus revealed truth to us about the spiritual world you have to be very careful I was looking recently at a documentary and they were talking about the gospel according to to um Thomas and the gospel according to 
to Judas um, and the gospel account to Mary Magdalene. And if you do a real study on these things, brethren, uh, you will realize how wicked these things are. First thing is that when you do study, you realize that anybody who wrote those books obviously had access to the gospel of Matthew and the gospel of Mark. They had access because they, they make a lot of reference to it. But the secret that is hidden, especially in the gospel account to Thomas, is that, look here, you can achieve God would, in a sense, our perfectness. And they're saying that that was the secret teaching that the church did not want us to have. And therefore, if you go to the gospel of Thomas, you start learning now that you can achieve this and that. And you can, you can become like Jesus in the sense that you cannot, you, you, it's, it's all inside of you already. And they're using this, this scripture where it says the kingdom of God is in you. And they're saying that, look here, all you need to do is to reach, get your mind to a place where you understand this knowledge. And therefore you move now from just a normal man to a man who is superior to your other brethren. Lies, brethren. These things come in and they try. And, 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 I, and I tell you, according to that documentary I saw, they said the secret teachings of Jesus. What a, what a thing. Brethren, all that you need to know is already in the word. Then there is this thing called Pelagianism. And this was developed by a British monk, Pelagius. And he lived about 354 to about 420 AD. And he goes the other way. He's saying that human beings can choose between good and evil and achieve salvation through their own effort without divine intervention. He went on to say that, look here, all of us were created innocent in the sense that when God, when you were born, you were born sinless. And therefore, you never had, you never had the origin sin. Amen. And therefore, just like when you were born, you can attain perfection through your own action. So by your own action, I know the whole term, they keep on going back to your own and your own self. The devil is a wicked, one of the wickedest enemies that you have. It's not necessarily the world. It's not necessarily uh, the, the, the devil. Your most wicked enemy is yourself. And that's what the devil wants you to put your trust in. Yourself. But the Bible says, if any man come after me, let him deny himself. Pick up his cross and follow me. So play yourself here. Original sin. Don't need, don't, don't, doesn't, you, you, you don't have the original sin. You can live. A perfect life and you can attain perfection. Amen. But that's a lie again from hell. Amen. Because guess what? The Bible says that we were born in sin and we were shaped in iniquity. And the only way that we can achieve salvation is through the grace of Almighty God. Amen. It's the only way we can achieve salvation is through Jesus Christ himself. No other way. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Then you have modern day uh, hearsays. So for example, the doctrine of, that came out of the Jehovah's Witness. There's a guy by the name of Charles T.S. Russell. He was the guy who started the whole teachings of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Amen. And if you do a study on him carefully, you're going to realize that this man rejected he was a part of some church, some nominal church. But he, after a while, he rejected the doctrines of Christianity altogether. And first of all, he became interested in the Adventist movement. A lot of us don't know that the Jehovah's Witness came out, really is, came out of the Adventist in a sense. Because most of the teachings are the same. He was around, he knew about the Millerites movement. He knew about uh, people like Ellen G. White. And he, he accepted most of the teachings of the Adventists, not the Seventh-day Adventists, the Adventist movement, because there was the Adventists before the Seventh-day Adventists. Amen. And what had happened is that, so you realize that all of the teachings that they have are similar. They, be, they both believe that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. They be, don't believe that the scapegoat um, is, 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 is practically, they believe that the scapegoat is the devil. Amen. And they have similar teachings. But he deviated from the Adventist movement eventually. But he still emphasized the imminent return of Jesus Christ. 
Amen. And he said that there's going to come a time where God is going to establish a theocratic kingdom on earth. And through that, he, he founded the Watchtower Society. Amen. In 1844. And they were sending out tracts. And they were teaching some things that obviously were anti-scripture. First of all, they denied that Jesus is God. And in order for them to do that, they had their own concept of scripture. Where the Bible says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. They say, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was a God. And why they say that is because they are saying that Jesus is that demi God. He's not the almighty God. Amen. In other words, they are saying that Jehovah God created Jesus Christ. So Jesus now has become a created being. Amen. So they deny Jesus Christ. They reject the cross. They're saying that, look here, the cross did not provide salvation for us. They're saying that the, the Jesus died in our stead, but it was not for the purpose, not for the ransom or, or, or the saving of man. Amen. They, 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 they reject the whole thing about blood transfusion. They look at Acts chapter 15 and they come with their own concept of what that scripture means. And the, the truth be told, in, in those days there was nothing, amen, there was no blood transfusion. That could not be what the scripture was talking about at all. What it was talking about was the, uh, was the drinking of blood, mainly animal blood, to appease the, the false deities. So I say, keep the Gentiles stay away from blood. That was a common practice for them. But they again go against scripture. They look at end time prophecies. And when I say end time prophecies, not end time prophecies like we look at it. But they made many predictions about the fact that God was going to come again. Just like the Adventists. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a friend the other day. And I was telling him about the sanctuary doctrine. And he was saying, what is the sanctuary doctrine? I'm saying, did you know, just like Jehovah Witness, the Adventists have made many predictions about Jesus coming. As a matter of fact, they, they came out of the Millerites movement. And the Millerites believed that God was going to come back at a particular time. Amen. And when Christ didn't come back, amen, they had they, they, they changed the date. And when Christ didn't come back at that point in time, they, they came up what is called the Great Disappointment. And from the Great Disappointment, um, Ellen G. White's husband said he was walking through a corn field. And he saw a sanctuary. And he said Christ did come, but he came in spiritual form. And he moved from one part of the sanctuary to another part of the sanctuary. So now they had what is called a sanctuary doctrine. And what did he do? He moved from the holy place to the more holy place. And he was judging the sins of the world. In other words, Christ didn't know the records of, of, of our sin. But now he's going through the records of us. So they, they come with a doctrine now called investigative judgment. Where God is now going through the records of everybody to see if we are in the church or not. Amen. All of these teachings are, are, are teachings of the devil. And people don't even realize that these things are not scriptural. Amen. And a similar way, the Jehovah's Witness made a lot of prophecies in relation to end time. Amen. And a lot of people were, have, 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 have been, as a matter of fact, none of their prophecies, well, obviously, came through because it was not of God. Even the concept of disfellowshipping. If you are a Jehovah's Witness and you decide that you don't want, they, they, they close you in. If you decide that you're going to do anything else outside that, they disfellowship you. And when they disfellowship you, that is the hardest form of, of social um, isolation. It, it has so much effect on these people. A lot of people have committed suicide by being disfellowshipped. Because your family have to turn their backs on you. That can't be of God. Everybody has to reject you. That's a hearsay. Modern day hearsay. And what I bring this to you for you to understand that these things exist. And these are the little things that creep in the church. You have the Mormonism under um, William Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith decided that, look here, he was going, he got a revelation from God. Amen. He add to scripture because now he said he got a new revelation about, about that we, that, that, what do you call it? the New Testament or the other testament of Jesus Christ. Amen. So he added to scripture. And he said that he got revelation and he was restoring, praise God, the true Christian church. Amen. And he considered himself to be a prophet. They go against the very Godhead. Amen. They believe that Jesus was, 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 was a total separate and distinct being. They don't believe in Trinitarianism, but they believe in Binitarianism. Because they, believe in, they don't believe in the Holy Spirit. They believe in God and they believe in Jesus. And they're like, like, they believe that the devil is the brother of, of, of Jesus. Amen. And in other words, they have Elohim. 
So in other words, Elohim is the father, Jesus was his son, and the devil was also his son. And God decided to send one to earth, amen, which is Jesus, and the devil was upset over it. And they believe that if we live a good life, we can reach a place where we also can become like Elohim. And they do this through their priesthood, um, their temple worship. So in their temple worship, they offer um, ordinances and they do stuff like baptism for the dead. And they, they seal the continent, they seal families together for eternity. Wicked ways. These are practices that are done. And one of the reasons why they do these things, you know, because Joseph Smith was a Freemason. Amen. And, and the, the, he has married the Freemason teachings into his theology. Amen. Their concept of God is, is so far from Christianity, it will blow your mind. They believe that, look here. The plan of salvation is so off that, you, that you, they believe in the pre-mortal existence. In other words, uh, you were in heaven before you came to earth. And then you come to earth. And then therefore, after your death, you, 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 the, the teaching is so mixed up, brethren. But the point is that we have to be realized that it starts from just a hearsay. It starts from just an injection of somebody introducing false teaching and eventually all of these teachings are developed out of this. Apart from the fact that they are false teaching, there are also false prophets that come in. And, and why am I telling this? I, I want you to understand why sound doctrine is very important. Because the moment you deviate from sound doctrine, I say, why people believe these things? I hope people reach this far. Why? Because they did not hold on to sound doctrine. So you have false prophets. And these are people who claim to speak for God, but promote a message that is contrary to the Bible. Or it lead to idolatry, it lead to immorality, or it lead to doom. So for example, in our time, you have people like Jim Jones. You have people like David Koresh. You have people like Harold Campin. All of these men are false prophets that have come and lived during this time. Amen. And a lot of people went through their hand, believed their teaching because of how charismatic it was, and eventually lost their soul. So, for example, Jim Jones. He was an American cult leader, and he found the people temple in Indiana in Indianapolis, in Indiana, in 1950. And he came up with some teachings that, I don't know, it was, it was, it was very crazy. As a matter of fact, in 1978, the, there's a congressman by the name of Leo Ryan, and he, 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 by this time, Jim Jones had a place they call Jonestown. And he went there to investigate the allegations that were said against Jim Jones, because he was doing a lot of wicked things against people. I mean, he was abusing some of the people. He was, he was, he had them under so much control. And he was saying, he was sleeping with some of the young girls. He was just doing some crazy things. And guess what Jim Jones did? And, and that's what I tell you, you have to know the word of God for yourself. That you do not know any, anybody don't tell you foolishness. Jim Jones, first of all, ordered his followers to kill Ryan and the, all the delegation and all the members of the press that had come with him to investigate the thing, he ordered a mass killing of these people. And even your people talk about don't drink the Kool-Aid. What you're talking about was what he did. Because he went on to say, look here, God is going to come back. All you need to do is drink this. So he gave the people um, a cyanide to drink. And said, drink this because you're going to meet your saviour today. And God is coming back. And over 900 people were killed that day in that camp. 900 people died because of this man. And 200 were children that died. So apart from the fact that he ordered the killing of, of, of Leo Ryan and the press, he also killed all the members that were there with him. Why? Because of false teaching. And guess what him do? He put a gunshot to him head. He killed himself. So after he realized that everybody died, he never took the cyanide, he put the gun to his head and killed himself. What a wicked man. You have a next man by the name of David Corish. And he led this group in Waka, Texas. And he claimed that he was a prophet. Amen. And he was, going to, and he, he, he was destined to bring about the end of the world. Amen. The man was, the man was wicked. In April 19, in 1993, that was just the other day, 
the FBI launched an assault on the of where he was and his compound and they used tear gas and tanks to try to force this man out and he said that a fire broke out where he was and 76 people including him and 25 children died in the place amen and guess what he was doing he was practically preparing the the, the place said this is the end of the world and he was launching up weapon weaponry and um illegal stockpiling of, of of guns and weapons and stuff like that to clash and attack because the world was no evil and his destiny as a prophet was to bring the end of the world and because of that a lot of people lose their lives but false prophet then you have people like harold camping and he is quite recent i remember i can clearly remember in 2011 may 21st 2011 this man said the world is going to end and you, you have people even in church who he was so convincing he was always was on a lot of billboards i don't remember it in 2011 that the world is going to come to an end and this is not the first time he did this but jesus tell you, you know if you read your bible you can't go wrong not even the angels in heaven know when he's going to come back but this man went into scripture and that's what they always do you try to use scripture to predict that god is going to come back at a particular time amen and a lot of people were swayed by the teacher it does show you how vulnerable people are because a lot of people believed it and believed him and he said that even when he died in 2013 he still believed that look here god was going to come back even though people by this time had realized that his teaching was false the man was so delusional that he held on to the teaching that's what false teaching does so we realize that false teaching show itself in hearsay it shows yourself in false prophets but here's a big one it shows yourself in worldly philosophies and you see i want to jump here because this is what is affecting a lot of young people a lot of these things are injecting themselves in the very church that we live so for example you have the whole concept and let me first define what worldly philosophers are their ideas are systems of thought that deny or ignore the existence the nature or the authority of god and instead rely on human reason experience or values you might say how this affect me let me show you how these things are affecting church today now the first one is atheism now no christian truly is going to adhere to this one but it still exists and i've seen I've, i know this young man who left the church and he went to college to study and at the end of his study he came up with the concept that god can't be real because of his teaching he got exposed to a lot of philosophy and he thought that look here based on my teaching god can't exist so atheism by definition is the lack of belief in the existence of god or deities they don't believe in religious doctrines they don't believe in supernatural entities and they base their worldview on evidence reason and science so while this is not the, the, the broad bush one we still have people in church who are affected by atheism because they're still questioning if god exists but you know what the bible says in proverbs 14 verse 1 it says the fool had said in his heart there is no god psalm 41 it says there is no god they are corrupt they have done abominable works there is none that doeth good so the very bible tell you that the fool say that there is no god and i'm going to show you why psalms 19 verse 1 says the heavens declare the glory of god that we call general revelation without you even realizing that the god named jesus or jehovah or whatever the very heavens declare his glory we talk about that and the firmament show it his handiwork amen and then the bible says in the book of romans chapter 1 and verse 20 21 for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made he is eternal power and godhead so that they are without excuse because that when they knew god they glorified him not as god neither were they thankful but became vain in their imagination and their foolish hearts were darkened in other words the invisible things of god 
are clearly seen by the visible things. And I'm going to tell you how we know this. So the Bible makes it clear to us that there is a God. Let's just try to argue this. We'll argue it first of all. Just as we're taking one argument. And there are many different ways that we can look at it. Amen. But we're looking at what is called the argument from design. The theological term is the teleological argument. But for simplicity, it's practically an argument from design. Now, we know, based on our past experience, we have discovered that whenever we come across a complex design, it is likely that the result of a designer's... It is likely the result of a designer's creativity. There's, we don't, sometimes we don't even question it. For example, if I see a watch, I don't assume that a hurricane came and blew and the watch formed. In our minds, instantly, we say, the watch, there must be a watchmaker. If we see a building, none of us don't get up one morning and see this high-rising building in New Kingston and say, boy, I don't know, some, some earthquake happened and the blocks fall into play and the glasses come and everything was in. No, a building implies an architect. It's something that was in the mind of somebody that was brought to fruition. Paintings imply an artist. So when we see paintings out there, amen, we see the painting of the Mona Lisa, amen, we don't think that something happened and there was a canvas and then the paint dropped on it and the, the ink just run into its place and it forms out. I don't know. Paintings imply an artist. And an encrypted message implies an intelligent sender. So, for example, if we see a message and there is repetition to it, even if, if it's encrypted or whatever, we know without the shadow of a doubt that, look here, the fact that there is a message here, there had to be somebody of intelligence that actually created that encrypted message. Now, I want you to understand something about design. The greater the design, the greater the designer. So, for example, a beaver can create a beaver dam. But a beaver won't create one of those dams that we use, those big wall dams that exist. Because that requires more intellectual thinking. The more complex the design, the greater the intelligence required to produce it. Now, one of the things that stares us in the face is the universe that exists. Now, think about it. No, but I said a while ago, no. How can atheism be true if everything around us is so complex? Get an example. Did you know that there are constants and conditions that must be precisely balanced to support life on earth? It means then, in order for you and I to live here on this earth, there are some constants that must be in place. So, for example, the oxygen-nitrogen ratio. It is said that the Earth's atmosphere is made of approximately 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. If the ratio of oxygen to nitrogen in the Earth was significantly different, it would affect the composure of the atmosphere and the ability for a living organism to breathe. If it does shift a little, then guess what happened? Me, you can't breathe and we can't live down here. And you're telling me, just based on the oxygen-nitrogen ratio alone, is enough for us to understand that, look here, it had to be a designer who created the earth and put us here with all the constants in place for us to live here. That's one condition. Look at this one. The distance from the sun. And we have said that all, all the time. The earth is located at an ideal distance from the sun. They call it the habitable zone. Some people say the Goldilocks zone. You know Goldilocks? Um, where, um, was it Goldilocks who were the one who said the porridge was too hot and the porridge was too cold, but the porridge is just right? So they're saying that the earth exists in the Goldilocks zone or habitable zone where the temperatures are suitable for liquid water to exist on the surface. When they, the scientists are looking out there and they're trying to look for another place that they're saying that man can exist to this very day, they can't find... They, they, they really can't identify with truth a, 
are another planet that exists. Look at other planets that are near to it. You have Mars, you have Jupiter, you have Saturn, you have whatever, whatever. All of these other planets that exist. And you're telling me that God put us on Earth and put it in, in its exact location, that habitable zone. You know why? If the Earth was located much closer or further from the sun, the temperatures on the Earth would be too hot or too cold to support life as we know it. It's just at the right location. And time would have failed if we tell about all the other factors. The gravitational constant, which means that if the gravity was a little stronger, amen, if, was, if the gravitational constant were much larger or smaller, then planets and stars couldn't form. As a matter of fact, we couldn't exist. You talk about the electromagnetic constant. You talk about the strong nuclear force. You talk about the, all of these things. And you talk about all of these constants have to be in place. And you are telling me that there is not a designer? The devil is a liar. The devil is a wicked being. So we come against atheism. And we are saying that sound doctrine says there is a God. Then there is a new philosophy called relativism. And it's a, it, it, it's a position and a belief that truth and values are relative to the context or the culture in which they exist. So in other words, I, I, I remember watching, reading something the other day about, a, well, I know of a situation firsthand. A sister walked out of the house of the Lord and people were, were, were saying to the sister, boy, we understand, this is your truth. This is your truth. You, you just do your thing. Do your truth. And I saw it and I said, if these people understood what they were saying. You mean, what they're saying is that their truth is relative to the individual. And they're arguing that there's no objective or universal truth. And that our morals and our culture may be true um, to us, but it might not be true to somebody else. But what does the Bible actually say about truth? The Bible says, look here, that... Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, truth is based upon Jesus Christ himself. Amen. And guess what we know about Jesus? It's absolute truth. It is narrow. He will say, look here, it's only my way or the highway. But you know what is even more worse than relativism? is a new concept they call known in postmodernism. Let me tell you what this means. And in order for us to understand this, and this is developed in the, like the mid-20th centuries, right? But in order for us to understand what is called most modernism, and, and I'm going to show you how this one now is affecting us in the body. There's a period of time that they call, in order for you to understand postmodernism, you have to go back to modern time, modernism, and you have to go back to pre-modernism. Now, pre-modernism says that truth, if you want to understand truth, you must base it based on the scriptures, it was based on God. As a matter of fact, it was based on the, what we call the Judeo-Christian Judeo uh, time. Amen. Our worldview, the Judeo-Christian worldview. So when we see things, we base things based on what the word of God says. For example, the Bible says God created male and female. We believe, we base it based on what the word of God says. The word of God says, look here, this and this and this and this. We believe it. So anything that we need to understand in the pre-modernist time was always based on the scriptures. That's why you see the scientists, even men like the old, those great scientists, their concept was really based on scripture. They always went back to the word of God to find out if they can match back to the word. Then there was the modern time which says, look here, we don't need God. Let's take God out of the picture. They're still believing that there is a truth, but truth was not necessarily based or cemented in God. Now, that, that, that came about in about the 1970s, in the modern time, that was the, the boom. You had, you had, and that was the time where you start having like the introduction of atheism and stuff like that, because now you start, you have the new atheists and all of these guys who start saying, you can believe this and this and this. There is a truth that the world rotates around the sun, amen, and um, whatever. There is truth to that, right? But you don't have to link it back to God. No, that is bad. But hear what the postmodern believe now. The postmodern now reject all of that and says truth is secondary to how you feel. In other words, your truth now is dependent on how you feel. So they have rejected the whole concept of God and know what truth is, is really how I feel about it. Now let me show you how this interject the church. 
A lot of people do not want you to speak truth to them because they're saying you hurt their feelings. What is more important to them is how they feel. In other words, let me show you an example of what is happening in the Western world. In the Western world, there's a debate now about uh, you can be a male stuck in a woman's body or you're a woman stuck in a male's body. And they say, look here, if I'm, a, if, if, you're a man, if I'm a male and I feel that I am not a male, and you call me a male, then I'm going to be offended. As a matter of fact, you can reach a place where I don't even fall within any one of those things on the gender spectrum. I can be what we call non-binary, which means that I'm neither male nor female, and therefore you don't call me male or female, you call me, you call they. As a matter of fact, in certain countries now, when babies are born, they are saying that like, you don't give them a gender. We don't write their gender. Let them decide what their gender is. Now, how does this affect the church? While we have not gone this extreme in terms of the concept in church, what has happened in church is that people are rejecting truth. And therefore, they're saying no, no longer, when you preach truth to them, you are making us feel bad. Why do you have to be offensive? Amen. It's, they're, they're more catering to their feelings than truth. But again, I tell you, brethren, there is some concept about truth that we need to understand. First of all, truth is objective. This means that truth is not subjective. It's not subjective to what you think. It's not discovered by a person's feelings, nor determined by private intuition. That's not truth. Amen. Truth is characterized. Uh, truth, truth practically is impartial. Truth is unbiased. Truth is unprejudiced. Truth is non-partisan. You know, you know, it, 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 it communicates the same message to every individual across the world. In other words, if it's true here, it is true there. Amen. If you need to get baptized and read the Holy Ghost to be saved in Jamaica, then you need to get baptized and get the Holy Ghost also in North America. You need to get baptized and get the Holy Ghost if you're in Africa. Truth is true. One plus one is true here. Just like how one plus one is true in Australia. Amen. Truth is objective. Truth remains, const it remains constant and doesn't contradict itself. It doesn't tailor its message to fit certain individuals. And it addresses every one of us equally. About the fact that truth is objective, truth is immutable. You know why truth is immutable? Because truth is based on God. And God does not change. And because God does not change, neither does his word change. So the truth is the same yesterday. Holiness don't shift yesterday because we are living in this time. Things don't shift because we are living in postmodern time. Brethren, no. Truth is immutable. God does not change and neither does his truth, which cannot be true today, but not true tomorrow. It applies across the board. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in Psalms, 119 and verse 89 it says forever O lord thy word is settled in heaven in other words there's no shifting of it there's no moving the mark truth remains true everywhere the bible says in isaiah 40 verse 8 the grass wither it the flood the flower faded but the word of our god shall stand forever truth brethren is immutable Right is always right, and wrong is forever wrong. Let me say that again. Right is always right. Right can't be wrong tomorrow. Right is always right, and wrong is forever wrong. And society doesn't have it to redefine morality. Amen. So nowadays, the church is having this big debate. And when I say the church, I'm talking the not the apostolic church, but the, 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 the Christian in Christendom. They are having a debate over if homosexuality is okay. And one guy, he got kicked out of the church because he said he can't accept the whole concept. God, it's anti-creation. But guess what happened? People want to redefine what morality is. They want to say, look here, we are living in this time. I saw quite recently with this, this famous televangelist, said, look here, she get two tattoos. And she was telling people why she got the tattoos. And said, I bet there's some um, Judas, uh, Pharisee Christians who are going to go against that. No, we're not Pharisee Christians. We are saying that the word of God does not change. And the Bible tells us in Leviticus that you shouldn't put no markings upon your body. 
my God. The world changes, kingdom rise and fall, but truth remains unchanging. Truth, brethren, is permanent. Truth is fixed. Truth is established. Truth is unwavering. And truth is always relevant. You can't outdate truth. Truth is never absolute or obsolete. Truth is never expired. Truth never win. I know why, because truth is based on God. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then guess what happened now? Truth is authoritative because it speaks to the supreme authority of God himself. It's directional. It tells you where to go. It's arresting because it allows you to hold your peace. You have to do what truth says. It's God's way or no way. We cannot pretend no matter what you do, that truth has not spoken. We cannot act as, you know, you know, the funny thing about it, I've seen where a lot of these people who have changed poor people, they have changed their sex, and they, they say, and then later on, and I've seen a whole heap of them where they say, boy, they regret doing it. You know why? Because you can't deny truth. Why do you think they, they're having this, they, they're trying to find everybody to validate them because they know in their head that something is, is, is not right. They know something is off and they want people to... So if you say, she, because it's a she you're seeing, and them feel say, you must be called they, then they're going to be upset because they want to be validated in something that is delusional. And this is the big debate. And that's where false teaching comes in. But we use sound doctrine for counter these things. So false teaching can come in various forms and from different sources. Let's talk, recap what we have said. You have hearsays like Gnosticism and, and Pelagianism and, and the cult like Jehovah Witness and the Mormons. And we have false prophets like Jim Jones and the, and the Harold Campion. And you have the worldly philosophies that atheism and relativism and postmodernism. And guess what? All of these things come with a consequence, brethren. Whenever we start to accept false teaching, what will happen is going to lead to confusion. It will lead to moral compromise. It will lead to eternal damnation for those who follow it. What do you think? Most of these people who have accepted some of the teachings, instantly, some of these teachings that are, that, that are finding them way in the house, instantly you start to see their, 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 their whole standard has changed. As a matter of fact, some of them don't even have standards anymore. Far teaching cause division. Far teaching cause strife. And deception in the church. It weakens the witness and the mission. Amen. When false teaching comes, I, I, I've seen on numerous occasions, I've, I've even had a friend of mine who was in church. And when, when, when they saw the picture, the first question somebody asked me, is not a Christian anymore. Because it weakens your witness. It removes your mission. And if the world can look at you and say, boy, something looks different about you. And they're not saying you're no, you're a Christian anymore. You're saying you're no. The question they ask is that you're no longer a Christian. You know why they ask that? Because even in their minds, they know what a Christian should be. Should, should be. First, it can influence or infect the culture. It can promote moral decay. It can cause social unrest. It can cause political oppression. All of these things happen when we... When, that these are the consequences of us holding on to false teachings. But as children of God, we must embrace sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. Sound doctrine, as I said before, the benefits are salvation. Sound doctrine leads to saving faith in Jesus Christ. When you hold sound doctrine, it's the only way to God and eternal life. It leads to sanctification. Sound doctrine produces growth, spiritual growth and maturity. That's how you know the doctrine is sound. Because you're, you're, you're not going down. You're not going down. You're going up. You start looking more and more like Christ. You start being separated. People start saying, no man, we love that. That person is a Christian. It enables believers to become more like Christ in character and conduct. In terms of your service, sound doctrine equips believers with a sound mind. It gives you sound speech. It gives you sound deeds. It enables us we be a witness, we serve each other, and we glorify God. Now, what are the methods for embracing sound doctrine? Now, we'll soon finish. First method is that we need to study the word. Brethren, 
Stop listening to every every teacher out there. Stop, stop. Some of these YouTube things that, that mess up a lot of people. The Bible virgin is the primary sword and the standard of some doctrine. And every believer needs to study it. You need to memorize it. You need to meditate on the word of God. And you need to understand it and apply its teaching to your life. You know the Bible says in Joshua 1 verse 8 that the book of the law shall not depart of your mouth. But you shall meditate on it day and light. So that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. You know, you know the word careful? You want to follow the word. For then you will make your way prosperous. And then you shall have good success. Some of us, we have become so... We, 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 we watch so much YouTube things and, and we get confused. But guess what happens? Just, just, just stick to the simplicity of the word. Stick in the word, man. Study the word. Read the word. Second thing we need to understand in order to embrace sound doctrine is listen to teachers. And when I say teachers, I mean God appointed teachers and pastors. People that can explain and apply the Bible teaching to the church. Therefore, every believer needs to listen to, to and learn from faithful and qualified teachers who uphold the teach sound doctrine. I can tell you something, brethren. If you really want, and I know people out here, there's a guy, he's the very, very good teacher. One of the best out there. And he has a podcast on YouTube. If you want something to watch, what, look up David K. Bernard, Apostolic Teaching for the 21st Century. A lot of things out there you can learn. Yes, and find good appointed teachers. No, 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 no. Don't jump on it. most of these motivational speakers who tell you that it's okay and there's nothing wrong with it. And then you start hearing because something they run through your life. I said before, as a child of God, we should live, we must live in a time where well, God, you know, one of the reasons why those, those forefathers were so powerful, these men lived a life that God, they, they, they want to be distinct from the world. The man, them love God so much that, boy, some of the things when they do, they seem overboard, but the, as, as night fall a day, they had, they had, they had, God saw their heart. They, 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 they never wanted to please their flesh, like the postmodernists want to do. They were concerned about just how they feel. As a matter of fact, if you talk about, if God was so concerned about how we feel all the time, then Jesus would not have died. You know what things Jesus got through? He was rejected by his friends. When he cried to God and said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Only John alone was there, as a matter of fact, you know. All the other disciples ran away. Then guess what happened? He was brought up to him, them tell lies on him. Then beat him. He got through all of these things. And you tell me, say, boy. And Jesus is saying that if any man will come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. He deny himself. What God is saying that, look here, in this time, we need to listen to people who say, look here, we need to sacrifice flesh and live for God. Proverbs 19, 20 says, Hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mightest be wise in thy latter end. Counsel, godly counsel. 2 Timothy 22, verse 2 says, and the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. He said, the same now commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. We need people who are willing to listen to people who study the word. People who spend time in the book. Amen. Lastly, we need to test the spirit. Now, a lot of these people, when you, when, when, when you order the day, when you look at what is happening, amen, in their lives, you realize that something is off. Most of these televangelists and most of these people, when you look at what they, 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 they're doing and how they exploit the people, and they, and, and they preach the prosperity message and say, they, not, not, not they're about sacrificing self and dying to self. Everything is about you can elevate to this and you can do that. But the Bible commands believers to test every spirit or teaching to see if they're from God. How do we test the teaching? Get back to the word of God. If a man said there are three gods and the Bible said there is one, then something we can't listen to him. Something is wrong. The Bible says in 1 John 4 verse 1, Believe, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. We need sound doctrine. We need sound doctrine. So as we continue to contend for the faith, we must embrace sound doctrine so we can conclude truly by saying that sound doctrine is critical to our spiritual growth and our protection from falsehood. 
Amen. As we live in this time, we need to say that, look here, sound doctrine is what is going to help us in this season to grow spiritually. Sound doctrine is what's going to create that fence of protection against all the teachings and the philosophies that exist. Understanding the significance of sound doctrine can shield us from false teaching and enhance our faith. Amen. We need all of these things that are coming at us in this season. The postmodern, the relativism, all of these things that are coming at us. We, need, we, we don't need to go far. We just need to be in the book. And relying on sound doctrine in our daily lives will strengthen our faith and equip us to share the truth with others. Brethren, in a, we are, I strongly believe that this theme that Bishop came with was sent from God. The Apostle Paul said, The Spirit speaks expressly. That in the latter days, many shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience sealed with a time, forbidden to marry and command to abstain from meat. The Bible said, The last is perilous time shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Postmodernism, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, all of these things are what we spoke about in terms of false teaching and false teachers having a form of godliness but denying the true power of God men and brethren I urge us that we stay in the book and keep holding on to the word of God don't just throw out what you have learned because you are somewhere else don't just throw out what you have held on to for years because society is shifting along that line but keep holding on to sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. Which is able to save your soul. Which is able to save your soul. Don't just listen to teachers. Who don't become them people who have itching ears. If we appeal to your desires. And just your feelings and your flesh. Check it out. Check it out. You know. My heart is broken to be honest. Because I know a lot of people really don't like this. They want stuff that... That, that they want ice cream, they want buffet, buffet doctrine. They want to pick and choose what they want. But it's either God's way or no way. If we had accept the whole book or none of the book. Brethren, let us continue to earnestly contend for the faith. And let us continue to hold on and try to understand what sound doctrine is. Let us continue to remain in the faith. God bless you. God bless you. We have spent a good amount of time, but God bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Let's bow your heads as I pray. Great God, we thank you, Lord God, for your love and your mercy, your grace and your loving kindness. We thank you, Lord God, for the word that was spoken today. Your word is spirit. Your word is life. You say, where it all shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed to the word of God. Forever, your word is settled in heaven. God, help us, God, to be wise. Help us, Lord, to recognize when false teaching is coming in. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be, even like the church at Ephesus, who was able to pick up false apostles and they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be at the same time that like the church at Philadelphia, who God, irrespective of the shaking, hallelujah, irrespective of what is happening, we'll be like those pillars, that when the shaking and the earthquake happened in Philadelphia, the city, the pillars remain standing. Help us, Lord Jesus, to stand upon the word of God, to hold true to the word of God. In this season more than ever, God, we need people who want to be in the word, people who want to live for you, people who want to be separated from the world, people who, who do not love the world, who recognize that the love of the world is enmity with God. God, we thank you, Lord, for what was spoken today. God, I pray that you'll open the ears and the hearts and the minds and the spirit of every person who watched this Bible study tonight. God, let him not even just listen to any big thing, but the spirit that is conveyed behind this message tonight. The spirit, the, 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 the word, the doctrine, the foundation of the apostles that the apostles died for, that you shed your blood for. Let it be injected in their spirit. Let them have that burden and that conviction.
that I must live for you who died for them. God, we thank you, God, for what you have done today. Bless each and every person. Continue to bless the House of Faith Chapel. Continue to bless the saints in general and every person who watch this. Oh God, those few persons, God, who have not bowed their knees to Baal, but are deciding that in this season, they're going to stand up like the three Hebrew boys in, the, in a Babylonian system, in a Babylonian society. They decided they're going to eat the king's meat. They decided they're going to wear the king's garment. They're going to defile themselves. But they're going to stand up for Jesus. Help us, Lord Jesus, in this time that we will stand up for you. We will live right. We will walk right. We will talk right. We will dress right. We will speak right. Our minds will be renewed by the word of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for what you have done today and for what you're about to do in our lives. As we look to you, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. We thank you, God. We thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you for sticking out this Bible study tonight. I know there's a lot that was covered. Amen. But you can watch it again. You can make your notes. Amen. You can do your further research. But what is important, most of all, as the Bible says in Joshua 1 verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart of your mouth, but you shall meditate day and night. Stay in the book. In this season, we need people who are in the book. God bless you in Jesus' name. By way of announcement, on Sunday, amen, we have Ignite. You know, next week, Sunday, coming is the starting of our youth convention. Amen. And you can rest assured that it's going to be a blessing. We have Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. There is a singspiration, praise God, that will be on um, in Ignite. But I'm expecting that every saint get yourselves ready to have a, a great convention in the presence of the Lord. Remember on Saturday, amen, there is the the Thanksgiving service for the life of our goodly brother, Brother Mark Harrison. Amen. The good thing about us, you know, the, the Apostle Paul says, we don't die, we sleep. And to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, you know. Continue to remember his family, his wife, amen, his daughter, that God will strengthen them. Amen. This, this, this didn't take God by surprise. God knows what he's doing. Amen. And, our, and I strongly believe our brother, he had enough time if there were anything, you know, in 11, had enough time to get himself ready. And I strongly believe that right now he's probably looking at it and saying, boy, I'm better off, you know. And it's, we're, just, we're just going to remember the Thanksgiving service over the weekend on Saturday. I'm not sure of the time, amen, that the service starts, but it should go out in the communique from the communication department. So look forward for that. And where you can come and support will be uh, at uh, Old Arbor Road, uh, Priest sanctuary courts of praise courts of praise amen we'll be at that church on saturday so we look forward to us coming out and supporting amen sister harrison amen as we celebrate the life of our goodly brother god bless you amen god bless you stay faithful to god continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our lord and our savior jesus christ god bless you in jesus name